Welcome to Swiss Impact with Banerjee. I'm Svetlana. And I'm Ben. In season two, we will be traveling around the globe, out of Switzerland, and bring amazing leaders from businesses, thought leaders, political leaders, of course, investors and experts. We are working at implementing and realizing all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals better known as SDGs. And they are also making profit. Hello, I am Amina Gurifakim and I'm the sixth president of the Republic of Mauritius. My name is Parvati and I'm a musical artist and the founder and CEO of Parvati Foundation. I'm Alicia Dishbizar. I'm an entrepreneur here in Dishbizar. I'm running on one side a financial services a company. You know, hundreds of deal f- deals a month, mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. are seeing more things happening in this impact world. And this is yeah. because, look, the world is changing. So join us to discover impact investing ecosystem. See you every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Central European time at Swiss Impact with Benedict. See you on Friday. Act with impact. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone and for our viewers from Far East. <laughs> Good night. Welcome, welcome to Swiss Impact with Banerjee's. Today we are at the week 10 of season two. And we are here because the world is changing. <laughs> In our show, we interview investors, policymakers, business leaders, impactful businesses in order to create impact, to encourage them to create more impact if they're already doing it, or to inspire you, our dear audience, uh, to take in action and change your life and life of many other people for better. So before we start, <laughs> as many of you know that my sister Joya passed away a couple, more than a month ago, and we still are doing a project called Project Joya. You can find all information on camomile.ch. That is C-A-M-O-M-I-L-E dot C-H. And we are trying to get help and support to people in the rural areas of India, people who cannot afford or who are under um, underprivileged people. So please, please, all your help is welcome. And many, many of our viewers and people have already helped. So thank you very, very much to them. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. And uh... Usually we talk about our course, but at the moment we are not running any courses. <laughs> so <laughs> we are completely the summer full. <laughs> is coming <laughs> completely overbooked with uh, mentorship students. But anyway, keep an eye on Camomile. One day or sooner or later, we will announce the next uh, course on profitable business with impact, where you can learn about how do you actually create a business which is not only profitable, but most importantly, also impactful and does something good for our planet and for people. You, ben, <laughs> do you have any story today? But something, something <laughs> cool, something big. Okay, so normally, as you all know, environment and climate is my favorite. So that's why I have been talking quite a lot about climate justice. But today, today I want to talk about social justice. Uh-huh. So we have been hearing since a long, long time that companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, Starbucks, they have been hardly paying any taxes at all, especially in the markets and in the countries where they are making their most profits. Although now President Biden is trying to catch up to it. He's trying to fix the global tax system, and he's even backed by the G7. Although, of course, the Republicans are trying to sink it. For obvious reason. But isn't it old news? I mean, uh, it's nothing new to mention here, there. Rich so, people usually don't pay taxes or very little. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> that's exactly my point for today. That um, what we know that the world is reeling still with the COVID-induced economic downturn. Hundreds of millions, even in India and other countries in the United States, are being people are being pushed into poverty, bankruptcies, unemployment rising everywhere, mm-hmm. and people are really, really having trouble to meet their to make their ends meet. But there is a magazine called ProPublica in the United States, which got which is an investigative journalistic magazine, and they got access to to super super secret IRS oh, data from the United <laughs> States, and came with following points: Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man 
paid zero cent tax in the year 2007 and 11. Mm -hmm. Apparently, in fact, he and his ex-wife have been <laughs> receiving child benefits from the government. Well, they have the right for that. No? <laughs> exactly. Uh, why not? And the list goes on. Same is valid for Elon Musk, who is now a role model for many, especially mm -hmm. the youth. Even my son is ro crazy about him. It turns out he pays no federal income tax. And the list goes on. Michael Bloomberg, Carl Icahn, George Soros. Wow. So while median American household earns $70,000 annually and pays 14% federal tax, and the highest income tax rate is around 37%, this completely debunks the Republican theory that all pay their fair share and the rich ones carry the most burden. Wow, this is really like cool scandal, <laughs> no? And... Uh... <laughs> Like, I want to thank the person who leaked out the data for his, his or hers bravery, because I guess this person, when he or she was doing the taxes, she just had it. Maybe he was or she was paying more than those people. And uh, it's kind of not about justice right here. And uh, the thing is, actually, those people are using the same children's school or market to sell their products, labor infrastructure for which we are paying. Exactly. And they're not paying even a cent for that. So in other <laughs> words, they are living on the money of others, which I think Tesla inventor could afford to do something more than that. Yeah, that's my point. So so that and this is not only limited to US, it's also happening in Europe and I'm sure it's happening in other countries in the world. So that is my point is, where is the social justice? Well, thank you for this <laughs> depressing but hot news, Ben, <laughs> today. <laughs> and the question is actually, what do we do with that? And um, do they them themselves realize uh, that it's not the right thing what they're doing? Like, uh, is Elon Musk, who is also representing sustainability with electric car, realizing what he is doing and which message he is sending out there for millions of people and youth. And this is why we are not talking only about impact investing, but for me, it's much more, it's consciousness shift that we are here uh, not uh, just trying to create profit by using impact, but is actually impact first. You know, the mission should be first. And then along the way, we can live with that. So we can sustain our livelihoods and our lives. So this is so, what so I think about it. Thank you. And today I want to, so since every time I tell the stories, so today I want, before we get our guests in, Svetlana, please explain to the audience, because I hear everywhere sustainable investment, sustainable investment, sustainable, sustainable products, financial products. But I hardly hear about impact investment. Just in short, can you explain to the, our viewers what is in basic difference in a layman's language, the difference mm -hmm. between impact investment and sustainable investment. Well, impact investing is also belongs to sustainable investing, but not uh, vice versa. So basically, if you look at the market, the sustainable investment market globally is around 31 trillion US dollars. Impact investing is only part of it, 800 billion US dollars. And the big difference is that the most sustainable investment practices they start with simple exclusion of certain industries like tobacco, gambling industry, or uh, weapon, pornography. And then they go further towards impact. They define ESG, environmental social governance practices, to select better enterprises uh, based on these criteria, which uh, they reduce waste or they empower women, so more women are at the top positions, and so on, right? And they are slowly step by step going into to impact investing which is at the top of that pyramid and which needs much more capital because impact investing has an underlying mission compared to sustainable investment which are still mostly profit driven compared to impact so here is a big difference and like iceberg if you look at that so sustainable investment is broad impact we need them. We need big corporations, of course, to transform and uh, change industry standards. But we desperately need more capital into impact investing, which are trying to solve also sustainable development goals defined by United Nations. Okay. <laughs> now, at least I understood what it means. So now we want to invite our guest for today. Welcome, Mika. 
Welcome, 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 Mr. Antonin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It was uh, interesting to hear those uh, tax tax news uh, from the United States. Here in Nordics, uh, we all pay taxes and uh, it can be also checked by everyone uh, from the authorities. So our system at least is very transparent and very different compared to any other other areas of the planet so in that respect we can be we can be at least proud of that exactly and this is why you can be so cozy in your chair right so because the consciousness is fine then everything is yeah, fine. yeah. and the best yes. is in america instead of finding out why this is going wrong they have started an investigation to find out who leaked out the tax report <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a that's a good question. That why why they are doing something like that. I guess it's a big big part of the history and uh, and uh, taxis uh, at the beginning of the mankind where the taxis were invented. Most of the cases, tax taxis were collected by kings or uh, or somebody like that, and uh, and they di didn't deliver too much back to the people who paid taxes. And that's why the culture to pay taxes is. Uh, is in most of the areas of the, the planet quite low but in in finland for example we have always got quite a lot back while we have paid taxes and the whole social security system education system they are all free so uh, if you compare that uh, what we are paying taxes you are getting benefit back uh, straight away and uh, everybody is getting that and uh, and i guess that is uh, one reason why if, uh, Finns and Nordic uh, societies uh, overall, they are happy taxpayers because they are getting quite high benefits back. Uh, education in the United States, for example, it will cost a lot of yeah. money and exactly. uh, we will get it all for free. Yeah. No, no, I, I had a, I mean, I didn't want to get into this discussion, but I had a very interesting ta chat today with my son during breakfast because he's studying history and he was talking about Versailles. That in Versailles, in the king used to get all the taxes where um, he spent more food on his more money on his food than maybe the whole city could live on, and that's well, how it collapsed. If we will look at the history and uh, look at all those places where we are visiting and watching, wow, what a kind of building here! Who has made it, <laughs> and uh, how is it possible? And uh, and we we should remember that uh, somebody has collected taxes <laughs> and exactly. build up build up the monument for himself or uh, somebody else, uh, for the queen or lover or whatever. And uh, now we are visiting places and say, oh, fantastic! <laughs> so this is why I suggest let's go to the present and please introduce. Introduce yeah, Mika so, to our audience. So, uh, with this, I introduce Mika. He's not only my colleague at Climate Leadership Coalition, but he is the founder, principal shareholder, and chair chairman of the energy company called ST1. It's a Nordic company. He began his career as a private individual in fuel trade in '96 and built it up to this diverse Nordic energy company, which today pursues its vision to become a leading producer and and seller of CO2 aware energy. So this is like, this is like music to our ears. So this company's uh, uh, Mika's company is investing very very heavily into renewable energy research and production, from industrial wind power to advanced biocells, and of course geothermal because I myself has have visited uh, your uh, your factory at Espo. So yeah. with this, we welcome Mika. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so uh, as Ben mentioned, and uh, before we start, uh, I'd like you to tell also your story, what people don't know about you or what we didn't say to make it more interesting, not I, just a um, yeah, exactly. introduction, how, how, but how did what you is end your up, story? Uh, how did you come in the petroleum sector or in the fossil fuel well, sector? Well, well, I, my, I'm very... I'm not very good to, to talk about myself, so <laughs> I try to keep it uh, short, but... Uh, it was a coincidence, uh, basically. I I was uh, studying in University of Technology in Helsinki Energy, and uh, one morning uh, uh, I got a call, uh, and it was call came from the from the trading trading department of uh, Neste uh, Oil. Neste Oil is a local oil company nowadays, uh, the biggest uh, renewable diesel producer worldwide, and. Uh, they have noticed that I have done something crazy things in my university 
studies uh, or same time and uh, and uh, they like the, the the activity what i have i have done and they ask uh, could you come to interview and join us uh, to work we need uh, persons like you uh, for uh, international trading and uh, i said well why not and uh, <laughs> then i ended up to the Nestle trading department at that time trading business uh, globally it was a very new thing we lived at uh, year uh, 1989 and uh, there were not too many people who were doing the trading overall and uh, and it was very huge opportunity for young student like myself and uh, i took advantage out of it and uh, and i i worked very hard at these first uh, 5 6 years at that time we didn't have any mobile phones or things like that so you had to be in the office all the time and when singapore started uh, very early in the morning uh, four o'clock a.m uh, and then the new york finished good new york finished uh, 10 o'clock uh, late uh, late evening it was lucky that uh, my wife at that time uh, she was working also elsewhere so <laughs> we didn't have too much uh, uh, home problems during that that period but Really, I, I learned a lot. I, I was capable to do the business around the world and, uh, and it was a fantastic opportunity. And then I started to see how this world really looked like from an energy system uh, perspective. And, uh, and it was a very good school to learn the global energy system. And uh, in certain point, uh, 96, I decided that uh, well, I have got all the lessons from this company, but unfortunately, I cannot see that future is in, in corporate. I would like to be entrepreneur, and uh, and I started to do same things uh, for my own account. And I was very lucky, uh, I have to say. I was uh, young; I couldn't understand all the risk. <laughs> if if I would have understood them, uh, probably I wouldn't have started. Uh, and uh, and we didn't have, have at that point we didn't have children uh, that was big uh, big thing as well that uh, i i didn't have responsibility to take care of the uh, the family my wife is much more well educated than i am as she's a doctor <laughs> and uh, and a uh, cancer doctor and doing doing uh, doing, much more, doing much more much more uh, valuable work than i am but uh, anyway we i had an opportunity and i was very lucky at the beginning oil price was very low and i was capable to do the business between the continents and uh, and that uh, that was really my core competence and uh, then um, when the children start to start to come to the picture i uh, it was a year 2000 something then I started to think that, that what is the purpose of my life? That it cannot be that I'm uh, buying uh, cargo from uh, South Ab uh, or uh, Europe and selling that to the South America, or buying cargo from uh, Europe and selling that to United States. Uh, there has to be something else. And uh, then uh, I got a, again a good luck. I, I sold uh, the trading activities to a company called Enron, U.S.-based company. <laughs> Enron went to the bank. Enron went to the bank robbery, but not because they spot <laughs> our, our trading activity. <laughs> so, <laughs> the moment so you said was, Enron, I was thinking, aha, uh, I know the name. And, 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 and then, uh, then uh, with that money, uh, we started to do local pieces with the decent working hours. So uh, uh, it was a big jump to the uh, uh, area where I, I was not specialist at all. But based on the trading know-how, we managed to supply the system very very efficient way and uh, and uh, then uh, we started to be successful there as well and uh, little by little we we crowed cr all the time and we bought uh, assets of big oil companies when they decided to give up uh, small markets like finland sweden and norway and we growing uh, from fossil uh, to to the states where we were actually 2006 and 2006 is in in, in it's a big milestone because that date i just look at for this uh, tv show uh, when when we established our uh, strategy vision uh, to be co2 aware energy producer and seller it happened uh, 2006. 2006 2006 wow. yes we were so far since, ahead of everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, we we started the wind power project already 2004, but this energy, uh, this uh, strategy vision has been there same uh, since 2006, and it's going to be there 
as long as I'm going to stay alive or <laughs> as long as I, I'm I'm allowed to, to, to run the board of the ST1. So let, if, I, if I'm losing my sense, uh, maybe they then uh, kick me out. But uh, but uh, anyway, as long as I'm a, I'm a charge, uh, that is going to be our our strategy vision. And uh, we have done work uh, since that very systematically uh, to, to go into transformation. And one thing is very I'm yeah sorry you. yeah just, uh, sorry sorry I'm talking uh, all the time I know too much. we are here all talkers <laughs> you know we can talk for hours <laughs> so it's just explain to our audience why we have you as a chairman of a fossil fuel company right because it's not really impactful in this way but you know you are one who is representing the transformation of companies of energy sector and this is why we uh, invited you you know to be to set up new standards in energy sector so could you please explain to us and tell us more about your activities of your com company in this sector like renewable energies how do you transform to more sustainable practices yeah, uh, it's very important uh, to understand, first of all, that the uh, energy sector is transformation business. And I guess we do, uh, we understood this uh, very early stage after 2000, that this energy sector has to be transformed from fossil to renewable. Then, of course, we were a very small company at that time. And I didn't have a balance sheet like uh, Shell or Exxon or anything like that. We were very small. So we had to pick up those areas where we really can do something in real life, make investments which are the size of our company. And uh, But anyway, we, we have a clear idea that we have to start to walk this path. And in end of the path, uh, we don't know where it leads to in final end, but it goes away from the fossil world it goes to the renewable world. And we did uh, all these things what company our size can do 2006. And we started with, uh, with waste uh, production, waste-based uh, ethanol production. It was very small unit uh, in, in, uh, in Finland and uh, we used uh, bakery waste and we made out of that uh, ethanol. And simultaneously we started our wind power, first wind, windmill project uh, in in a city called Pori and uh, and uh, then little by little we we have grown since that uh, today's position where our turnover it was uh, if I remember correct uh, I don't look at too much turnovers but it was uh, roughly six six billion uh, euros out of that today 20 percent is already renewable and uh, some, somebody might say that uh, 20 percent it's not much uh, but if you start from the zero and you have done that uh, with your own equity with your own cash flow uh, uh, and uh, and in 15 years time i'm at least um, quite happy about it of course we could have done even more but uh, we did we haven't what had any more aim? resources what would be your aim like the number where you are targeting like this which of course we have? of course we are targeting to the situation that we don't have any fossil left but uh, when when that could when that could be the case i don't know so mm -hmm. it's not only only our effort which accounts mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, really the regulatory environment uh, uh, it's uh, totally depending on also how our, our customers will behave what kind of uh, products, uh, what kind of uh, cars they are buying. Uh, there are many, many different type of uh, issues which has impacted how quickly this will happen. But one thing is for sure, it will happen. And, mm -hmm. uh, and sooner or later. And uh, I, I, I have always said that um, this setting this target, uh, what our political leaders and now even business leaders are doing, one way they are good to have, but uh, if you are stuck with the, with your targets, uh, sometimes you start to do a little bit stupid things, and uh, and uh, then you have to see that uh, if the if the technology, for example, is not ready for the big size investments, mm -hmm. you should do the small investments until it's uh, it's uh, basically 
uh, ready for the big investments. I can give you a very mm. good example. The wind wind energy in Finland 2010, when we had our first big uh, park ready, the the production cost was uh, 58 euros per uh, megawatt hour. Twen ten years later, only ten years later, the production cost uh, for our latest uh, wind park was 28 euro per megawatt hour. So the drop of a uh, production cost in yeah, ten panels, years time. Yeah, so Solar panels are also dramatically decreased in terms of cost for production. So it happens when the industry is changing, when systems are changing, of course. Yeah. And, and that is very important to rem remember that when we are doing the investment, we do it at the right time, then we are getting the best value for the money. Yeah. And, and if you start to do it too early, then you are spending a lot of money, but you are not getting that much result. And on the other yeah. hand, if you are too late, then we are yeah. too late. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. uh, so uh, timing is here very important, uh, important matter, especially from companies' point of view. Of course, uh, when the national uh, our world leaders are talking, they, they, they can set the targets for the planet, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's a different thing to set the target for the companies. Company. Exactly. Yeah, and, and I was going through very quickly through your annual report because you publish everything out there. You're completely transparent. So uh, you describe, can you describe what kind of renewable energy you're investing in and whether uh, your investment is in creating yep, the infrastructure yep. to sell the renewable energy or doing research on finding new kinds of in renewable energy? All of them, but uh, I maybe pick up uh, only a couple of them. Uh, just to save your time <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the uh, most important uh, matters what we are doing uh geothermal heat is definitely one we have a, a plant in in espo i you mentioned yeah. that when yeah. already it's uh, only one in the planet where we have a two uh, six kilometers deep uh, uh, hole uh, to the solid rock and now it has been great, fantastic uh, uh, platform for us to develop the, re, uh, the geothermal heat mm -hmm. uh, to the commercial scale. And now we already know that uh, the commercial uh, production plants are not going to be six kilometers <laughs> deep holes. Uh, more likely they are going to be 1.5 to 2 kilometers. But uh, without doing this type of test, we couldn't have find the ways mm -hmm. to how is the best way to operate on those deep uh, deep uh, conditions yeah. and uh, it has been very very important to have this platform but that's it that's a good example to, to to do that when we started we didn't have a clue what how is going to be is, uh, is it going to be successful at all what is going to happen and the total budget was roughly 40 35 million euros uh, it ends up today today's situation is that we have consumed 100 million euros and still it's not uh, operating like we planned it it should be operating we are getting it to that level but it still costs a little bit more but we have learned a lot and this is a very good example that uh, what does it mean when you are doing research and developing work in uh, in the energy sector you have to be able to put a lot of money uh, to start with and and then uh, results cannot be guaranteed and uh, and uh, you have to have vision and you have to strongly believe on what you are doing mm -hmm. uh, for us uh, the benefit is of course that uh, we don't have to uh, obligation to pay dividends is uh, while we are not stock listed so that's uh, that's uh, that's that's <laughs> helps uh, then two others, which I just mentioned, uh, uh, three actually, uh, we we are developing uh, biofuels, which based on uh, 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 sustainable raw materials, raw materials like sawdust uh, from the pulp and paper industry. Yeah. They can't do anything with that. Uh, it's uh, forty percent uh, water, and uh, and uh, present uh, biofuels are not going to be very big solution for the for the climate change battle because uh, lack of sustainable raw materials so on biofuels the the key thing is that we have to develop the new technologies to be able to adapt uh, sustainable uh, raw materials and uh, that is the key that's what we are doing then we are 
in wind business, that's I, I already uh, said, we have sold our own uh, meals uh, to the pension funds. They are nowadays happy with two or three percent return. So we thought that it's better to, to be operator than, than keep it in our own balance sheet. We can do much more with that money in other areas. And then one thing what is very important in climate change fight. It's that we are in, uh, involved in, in copper farming, so reforestation. And uh, we have now a couple of projects what we, I cannot say anything about because they are together with stock listed companies and outside of Europe, but very promising, uh, promising uh, project where we have a totally new uh, measurement uh, uh, system together with us. So uh, in the University of Helsinki, there is a, a scientist called Marku Kulmala, who is one of yeah. the w most well-known uh, scientists on the area. And he and his group has developed the measurement system that we can uh, specifically measure how much trees will absorb uh, uh, coal uh, to the earth. Not uh, just, uh, just uh, to the tree, but because tree has to be cut and used in some states, yeah. but that which, uh, part with which goes to the roof, that is important and uh, then that that is yeah. that can be measured and while you can measure that then you can make it a commercial product and then the market can start to uh, start to work and uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, that is very very interesting i think it's uh, one of the areas where we might hear in uh, 3 4 years uh, very good news that we have a, a carbon sink market and a possibility to build yeah. a carbon a carbon sink market because we need much, much yeah. greener planet as well. We have already 1,000 uh, uh, million tons extra CO2 in the atmosphere. And one way or another, it has to be taken back to the Earth. Yeah, exactly. So uh, am I understanding right, just for our audience, you know, we were talking about EU life carbon farming scheme where you are also participating, right? So in your, yes. in the forestry, deforestation, forestation, uh, uh, we would like to, yeah, we would like to invest uh, to the reforestation, but this is very important to say that together with the local population, the, the mm -hmm. schemes has to be built in a way that they have a earning philosophy in this project and on their cult based on their own culture and based on their conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. When I, in, we had, a, uh, we have it in Morocco, one, one uh, testing, uh, uh, where we, we are checking that which trees are working best in different type of condition and what kind of irrigation system needs to be there and soil improvement and so on. And uh, when we, we talk first time with Morocco people, they say, they're asking that I, 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 we told everything and uh, you are getting all the benefits. And then they ask, that, oh no, Mr. Antonin, what benefits you are getting? You are putting money here and what you are getting? Oh, we, we are getting uh, CO2 in atmosphere down. And they look at each other. This guy must be totally crazy. <laughs> 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 but then, then, then we explain that uh, there will be or uh, it's condition for the whole thing that, that there has to be a carbon market where this exactly. uh, secretion of the carbon back to the soil, uh, there is a value for it. Yeah, and exactly. this... Otherwise, this does not, of course, happen. But if if that there is a value for that, then you can keep clean water, what you are getting as a side product. You can keep all the trees and cut them uh, once in two years time, where, because then you can cut them and put the new new one uh, instead. And uh, mm -hmm. because we want to get this uh, carbon back to the to the earth, okay. and uh, yeah. that is what we would like to do. So it's. We cut the tree and put the new tree again, and uh, and uh, that is the that is the idea, and um, yeah. uh, that is something what I'm uh, very very keen on to see to happening because this emission cuts we we do see that there is a path how to do that one, but we also have to get simultaneously uh, uh, extra carbon from the atmosphere back to the earth. exactly, and I think there you Finns have really really a lot of knowledge and expertise in that's, the forest engineering that's, yeah. that's correct that's uh, I, I guess uh, we have a we have a very good knowledge on that and i i have said all the time to our forest industry that you should uh, 
you should put more effort into this one and help the world uh, to to, exactly. to do this. Yeah, it's but... just what I had in <laughs> mind, you know, to share it, you know, because some people just even don't know that such a possibility exists, yeah. and especially uh, fossil fuel companies. Like, how could you set up new standards for transition? You know, for more uh, companies to mm. doing what you guys are doing as well. You know, I, I think Finns are not very good at selling. <laughs> yeah, we, we are we are very bad on that. So yeah, let's exactly. let me put it this. Way. But <laughs> but uh, luckily, uh, I don't want to advertise any company here. Uh, but uh, I think. Um, company called Cell, everybody knows, and it, uh, they have been now a little bit uh, in the court as well, I have heard uh, uh, what comes to the emission. They have seriously put a lot of effort and money uh, to these kind of reforestation programs, but they are not uh, uh, recognized out of it uh, too much. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Have they marketing it or not? I don't know. Maybe people think that if Cell is doing something like that, it's greenwash or something. But I, I think they are they are very serious and uh, they they really uh, I can I can see that inside that they really would like to be successful in this field as well. They mm -hmm. called it natural based solutions, and the idea yeah. what they, yeah. they what they do have is pretty much similar than ours. That uh, we we realize that the fossil fuels we don't get rid of them in one day. Uh, there mm -hmm. are still, uh, even whatever we do, the oil is going to be there for a certain number of years. Uh, I don't know how many, but anyway, it's going to stay there. So we could, uh, I have asked from our politicians that please regulate us, that in case I'm selling a one liter of gasoline, I have to put uh, this many trees to somewhere. And yeah. uh, somebody, somebody then, Marco Kulmala and his scientists, they will measure that what I have done is according to the rules yeah so uh, that is basically a very simple thing and uh, but that's so cool please regulate us <laughs> but i think if you need to beg for <laughs> politicians to regulate you there is something wrong so how can uh, we and, and 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 what i also worry about is that there's so much knowledge about how to manage the forestry with finland but it's, if you look at EU, I can only speak from EU, a lot of policies or decisions are being made because they don't have that knowledge. So the mm. decisions also are not really very uh, correct. But that's another discussion. I just that's another talk, discussion. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And that will take a whole evening and a lot of bottles <laughs> of wine. <laughs> Can I bring some? I, <laughs> Do it a bit longer today. <laughs> no, but I also wanted to so say, you are an energy company, but most of the energy companies like you know, Shell and ExxonMobil, they have sustainability as a part of their CSR, their corporate mm. uh, social responsibility. But yeah. you have it as a core of your company policy. So how did were you always from the starting like this, or or did you evolve no. or transform into this? No, I, I no, I, I I didn't have it in the in the in, there as a starting point. Uh, I was very normal young uh, student when I joined Nesta Trading, and uh, I then learned to do my job. But in some point when I had that opportunity to see that how this world really works and then mm -hmm. when I got a children of my own and uh, I can't I, I can't say the exact day when I got an idea that we have to do things differently so mm -hmm. this cannot this cannot go anymore like this that we just uh, just uh, do the normal stuff and uh, sell oil and uh, wait that uh, how long it will last and uh, it, it cannot go like that i can't uh, i can't tell you the date when it happened it was a maybe two years three years uh, thinking process and then one day we had a our company management uh, seminar and we decided that uh, we we have to go into that direction that we will live uh, uh, live in line with this planet uh, with the mother earth and uh, and uh, how can we do that because we are selling gasoline and diesel <laughs> come on uh, so uh, then we 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 have to build up something out of that starting point and that is actually in my opinion quite encouraging for companies like shell and i think they have a they have noticed that now i'm talking about shell now because with them i have done a lot of uh, lot, a lot of work together uh, when i told them 2010 when i bought uh, uh, sell uh, Sweden and Finland 
I told them about our renewable visions and uh, CO2 aware energy and so on. And they were a couple of guys in, in London. They said that interesting, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but uh, the tone has tone has totally yep. changed. Tone yep. has totally changed. They have changed. They are yep. not mm -hmm. anymore same company. So I, I trust very much that the, uh, that the people, maybe public, uh, they don't know or they don't recognize it or maybe they don't believe on it. But Cell made a couple of years ago um, promise uh, that uh, they they release press release. I guess it was it was press release when they were saying that they are going to be to 2030 um, world biggest uh, renewable electricity producer. That's a hell of a promise. Uh, if yeah. they will keep that promise, uh, I, I can guarantee you that none of the other promises in this planet are not even even close to that uh, yeah. that that promise. So that, that's a that's a fantastic promise if they keep it. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and when we look at the other energy companies, there are many others who has uh, taken this very very seriously. They are on the right path, but there are of course companies who hasn't done anything. And I don't. Yeah want to start to point it out who uh, who are the bad guys and who are the good bad guys i i guess yeah i guess audience can read uh, the newspaper by themselves yeah, exactly. so uh, so you, i don't i can talk have, about the positive things yeah exactly then no, no, you must have heard the what mark carney said i think last week or two weeks ago when when he spoke you know mark carney the former yes, governor yes. When yes. he mentioned that all the companies who are aligned with the Paris Agreement or who are thinking about CO2, they will not only have more value for their shareholders, they will also have better business, more profit, and better for the community. And companies who are not doing it, they are going to end up with a massive amount of stranded assets. I think uh, in big picture, he is very right. I fully agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, but again, devil is in details. Uh, yeah. <laughs> while 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 you are saying that, you have to remember that transfer transformation has to be done uh, inside the company. Yeah. And uh, and uh, when you are releasing and closing down your fossil assets and building up the new ones, you have to look at that uh, how the environment will develop. If you don't mm -hmm. have any any. Uh, like electricity cars are something what uh, what what is very different uh, states in different countries. We are operating in Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Norway, uh, there are huge amount. Of it. I, I think yeah. its density of electricity cars is the highest on the planet. It's the number one. It's number yes, one. Yes, number world. one. Yeah. It's totally different to operate there compared to operate in Finland or Sweden. And yeah. and uh, then then you have to take into account. Uh, uh, the business environment and how the people are uh, behaving and and what kind of rules and regulations are coming by by politicians that is uh, that is a uh, company cannot just decide that okay we just now got rid of the all fossil and and we do yeah. something else if there is no demand so exactly. uh, so that is uh, companies uh, definitely should uh, look at the 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 future like mark said but uh, but uh, keeping in mind that while you are uh, saying something or justifying companies are they doing right or wrong you have to look at also the uh, the business environment and mm -hmm. regulatory environment what really they can do and what they cannot do exactly mm -hmm. but i think you have one very big advantage you don't have shareholders jumping up and down your neck <laughs> that is that is uh, especially nobody is complaining about too low dividends. So, <laughs> 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 because because we have a very very simple policy. I want to keep the company alive because uh, it's also sustainable that uh, your business is uh, going to be successful. That's very important. There are a thousand people working for our company, and uh, I can't let them down. I can't do stupid things in, in a way that they are losing their jobs. But uh, what I can control is that the part with the, what normal companies, stock listed companies would pay as a dividend, that money we can, the money what our employees has done from the market, that money we can use to develop renewable energy solutions. Yeah. And that's what we have done. 
Exactly. I see, I yeah. understand. Mika, but you are also investor as person and also, of course, as SD1. Can you share with us and with our audience what kind of investment selection criteria are you applying as person as, and as SD1 if it's any different? Because you have a lot of amazing projects who are looking for money, of course. So maybe there is someone who will be... Uh, and, uh, I mean, in re renewable energy and things <laughs> yes, like that. Exactly. Uh, it's very uh, good question and simple to to, uh, to answer as well. ST1 is only investing to the business projects, so uh, they they don't put money to the project where uh, which which is not done based on business logic. But then uh, Mr. Antonen can do other things <laughs> because uh, he is individual and uh, and i i have done um, uh, many things but but i don't want to advertise them because uh, i'm ha having already today uh, too many emails where people are asking <laughs> support for for a very good project but uh, but uh, yeah. of course uh, every one of us uh, has limited resources uh, limit yeah. is coming uh, uh, to everyone and uh, I I try to support as much as I can, but uh, of course I'm not uh, that type of guy. What you were talking at the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, uh, Elon Musk or any of those guys. Uh, I'm I'm a small guy from Finland, so am I. Well, my... You are paying your taxes, so in conscious <laughs> development. I yeah, mean, yeah. I pay the money. taxes. That's one reason why I don't have so much money to spend uh, <laughs> to the other purposes because I pay the taxes. <laughs> exactly. So, so now we leave behind ST1 and now we come to Mika. Yeah. So, um, so, but uh, let me please uh, yeah, add okay. one more thing. So, for all those who cannot approach Mr. Antonin as an investor, <laughs> please come to kamamile.ch, <laughs> register there, and we will invite Mr. Antonin anyway as a member. So, maybe one day or another day you will be uh, lucky and he will, Find the right he will project. get his attention. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I wanted to ask about is that uh, because I have also been involved in the sector of uh, alternative energy since quite a long time. And all, every time we begin with a positive intention. So I remember in Netherlands, we were extremely enthusiastic about bioenergy. Soya is, uh, we use soya bean for biodiesel. And we invested in it, we advertised it, we spoke about it everywhere. But now it turns out that this soya production is damaging the rainforest in Indonesia, in the Amazon, everywhere. So these, so we have this in the name of green investment and green policies, we are making decisions which are very good, which looks very attractive, but on long term, it is doing damages we did not think it will do. So I know that you have also thought on this topic a very, very much. Can you also give some more examples like uh, where we thought that this was a very good idea, we acted on it, and then we turned out it was not so green and not so good for the environment after all. Yeah, I, my experience, uh, really the own experience is coming from the biofuels mainly. And, uh, and uh, that's uh, when, when we started in, in 2006 with uh, uh, waste-based ethanol production, I, I was a great believer that uh, biofuels could play a very big role in our uh, transition uh, from uh, fossil to renewable. But then when we got more information and, uh, and uh, we discussed more with uh, different type of uh, uh, stakeholders, we started to realize that, oops, uh, these raw materials, uh, they are quite limited uh, what comes to the sustainability. And, and then, uh, then uh, we, we turned our direction to go into to the direction where we can maybe find more sustainable uh, raw materials. But right now, our ambition, this is very good example, this biofuel, that when ambition uh, level is uh, set uh, by uh, information what we had 10, 15 years ago, and now we are executing that, and new information has come up. And, and uh, it's when we set the biofuel target for EU, for example, we had an idea that uh, we can easily produce that much uh, biofuels what uh, EU re will request based on this mandate. But now when we have started to realize that what kind of raw materials we have to really use 
the knowledge has grown and we have started to see that really we can't use that much uh, we can't produce that much biofuels because if we produce there are very negative uh, impacts some other areas like yeah. food production is a very simple example but there yeah. are similar example uh, for example animal fat uh, everybody thinks that it's fantastic yeah. raw material for biodiesel but not too many people realize that uh, a good part of the animal fat will be used for pet food and then the question is that if pet food is not getting the the, the material from the uh, animal f fat market they have to get it from somewhere else because your dogs and cats they still eat and yeah. uh, and uh, then then uh, the benefit is not anymore that great or if we look at the used cooking oil which everybody thinks that it's fantastic idea that uh, we will take from restaurants the uh, used cooking oil and we use that uh, what has happened uh, uh, this is a little bit a joke but uh, but not but not uh, totally that uh, we we start to have more used cooking oil what we have uh, cooking oil so uh, <laughs> if you understand what what i mean that uh, because uh, value in the in the uh, diesel production is so high that uh, if you put one french fries to the cooking oil and then you said it's used cooking oil then uh, it's okay for the for the diesel production and uh, that will lead again to the uh, end result where we use the land uh, or uh, food production basically to, to be able to make uh, biofuels and that is not sustainable. Raw materials has to come from elsewhere and, uh, and then these logistical examples that uh, come on, we, we have uh, checked all our uh, supply chains where the product is coming, uh, we respect their human rights and things like that normal normal procedures and uh, on those checking uh, it's quite uh, quite interesting uh, cases while while uh, uh, we look at the used cooking oil from from china for example it will start from the restaurants with 10 liters cannons and uh, then it goes to the next station and next station and uh, uh, the the cooking oil moves uh, through the country and end up to the to the uh, to the Port where the seagoing vessel will take the the, the whole cargo uh, into Europe, and then uh, one of the diesel producer here then make diesel out of that used Chinese cooking oil. If you calculate CO2 correctly, yeah. mm -hmm. you can easily understand yeah. that it it's doesn't really uh, save the world at all. And if it, it's good thing, and it is good thing to use that used cooking oil definitely it should be used in china why why the hell we are taking that up to the europe uh, uh, and produce its uh, uh, city diesel the answer is very simple because in nordics for example we have a highest buyer mandate so we are paying highest price so uh, that's why we collect all these raw materials from china we ship it into the europe we make out of the city diesel and we uh, biodiesel and we tell the, the the audience that now we have done good, good climate uh, act and what we should have done we should have agreed with chinese that uh, uh, they will produce out of that used cooking oil uh, biodiesel and they will use it for example in Beijing or shanghai where the air quality is not the best possible so uh, those kind of things we have a plenty of them so uh this uh, uh and and this, logical business yeah yeah exactly and 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 every what is common to every one of these things and this is very important we should have a uh, checking in every act what we are doing that what are the global consequences if we do this if we only do the EU policy and we we stop the uh, stop the analysis to the EU borders, yeah. then then that's that's wrong. That's horribly wrong. Yeah. Uh, our politicians they have been telling us uh, quite long in EU that EU is so good example. We have had economic growth since '90 up to uh, 2020, fantastic. And then simultaneously we have cut down our CO2 emissions. Of course, we have cut down our CO2 emissions because we uh, decided to move all manufacturing industry to Asia, to China and elsewhere. And they are producing our products today 
and we are just getting them uh, by by vessels mm -hmm. or by airmail and and uh, the emissions will stay outside of the eu reach <laughs> so uh, that is that is something that you have to look at always the uh, the climate acts in a global content even if the uh, the regulation is uh, uh, area based or uh, mm -hmm. country based you you have to analyze it against uh, the whole whole world because uh, atmosphere does not respect the borders so that's uh, <laughs> that's something what uh, what you have to remember yeah and mika we also have another question for you you know last week we had uh, uh, one guest with whom we discussed actually the, the thing that no, fossil fuels alone cannot be blamed for destruction of our environment because uh, the society, as long as uh, it remains addicted to petrol, is also responsible for, for that. So what would you think about it and what would be the right remedy to change that? Yeah. It's 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 clear, but not everybody realizes it that our standard of living based on totally based on uh, usage of uh, fossil fuels. If you look at uh, where we were 150 years ago, uh, and look at where we are today, without uh, cheap and transferable energy, what we have got from the fossil fuels, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have computers. We wouldn't have any of that stuff. So our standard of living based on uh, fossil fuels and usage of fossil fuels. So then if we start to blame somebody that uh, it's your fault that the CO2 content is uh, so high, I guess that does not lead to anywhere. So uh, we are all all guilty and, and we are not guilty. I, 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 I wouldn't... Uh, try to find uh, the guilty ones it's not the fruitful it doesn't take an, us any anywhere uh, from uh, from the point where we are we should look at the, the future that how we are getting these big oil companies and who has benefit out of the fossil fuel most how we are getting those uh, stakeholders to take responsibility and uh, start to find new solutions anyway they have a huge balance sheets if we are getting all the oil companies and coal companies uh, to the to the transformation like SD1 is today, then we can really make it work. Yeah. So startups cannot uh, solve this problem. It's uh, it's. Um, I have uh, many times described the uh, the energy system uh, and trans transformation of the energy system. It's like a moving train. It's the rain train has to move all the time because you need electricity every day. You need energy every day, so train has to be has to move all the time. But same time, when train is moving, you have to change every part of the train, and mm. uh, that is that is a tricky exercise. And uh, and uh, the present train owners, they definitely are in best position to do the job. Uh, mm. So yeah, uh, the restaurant uh, department of the train enjoying the life. No, they yeah, don't care about exactly. Changing. We all are we all are passengers of, on that train, and uh, yeah. we would like to have a nice and smooth lift. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so uh, that that is uh, that is uh, something what we have to remember. I I I, I think it's not lead anywhere to to find guilty ones. We are in good track right now, and uh, we should keep the pressure on, especially on those uh, companies who still doesn't uh, recognize that they have to make the change, but uh, but not. Uh, pointing out uh, the, the, the companies that you are the guilty ones because of you we are in this uh, this situation that's not the honest way to look at it anyway so um, we are we are all guilty in that respect and, and talking about that I now want to come to the EU so uh, when I was still in the Netherlands so I remember the livestock was often moved out of Netherlands to Poland uh, process there brought but there was a lot of money made with extra subsidies tax benefits because of the eu policies the eu policies were still not that very well regulated on the borders but it was very bad for the environment and it was also very bad for the animal well-being and you also mentioned similar happenings of movement of peat stock within europe in your annual report can you explain what it is and and what are the pluses and the minuses of that 
Yeah, I, I, I already, I think I already answered partly to that question. Uh, this Chinese used cooking oil uh, was uh, was uh, one one ex one ex good example out of it. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty much uh, same type of category that uh, we we are, or that was in my mind uh, when we when we talked about it that this uh, Chinese used cooking oil. Uh, there are maybe maybe smaller examples, but that. That one, I, I guess, audience uh, already got it, so I don't want to yeah. tell the same story. Okay. But uh, that is that is basically good example out of it that we we are uh, importing uh, uh, raw materials, and uh, and uh, these raw materials cannot be then the developing countries or not even developing countries. China is not anymore developing countries, but. But we are taking uh, raw materials from elsewhere to our country because our regulator has put that type of uh, rules in place that we can pay m much higher price for the for the raw material yeah. and then raw material ends up here and then the country where we have taken the raw materials uh, away from cannot meet their own targets yeah. and mm -hmm. and and then there will be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, unoptimized uh, systems, and uh, that that was exactly uh, point what I what I said earlier on. When we are making rules and we are making policies, we should always have a global uh, uh, look at the, before we put it valid, because uh, then we can we can check that what kind of consequences will happen in yeah. in outside of our region in case we execute uh, the, the rules like like uh, we have wrote them exactly. and absolutely in and you know also i want to ask uh, the following question because it's very much connected to that as our population grows so we will require more energy and most of it is producing co2 emissions so how can we break this vicious circle in your opinion that's a that's a tricky thing I I have a talk with very high level politicians, or not very high, very high, but high level politicians <laughs> and uh, business leaders, and they all are, all all of them are saying that yes, we can break this uh, uh, this connection uh, between economic growth and uh, emission growth. Uh, Europe is good example out of it. Then I said, let's be honest about it. If we look at the Europe, uh, what has happened in that 30 years period, what you are talking about, how much uh, factories we have moved from uh, Europe to China and to third uh, countries. And that is the reason why our emissions has gone down. The products mm -hmm. what we are using is not anymore produced in Europe. And, uh, and they are produced, uh, China, globalization is the word what we are talking about here. Globalization. Uh, what comes to Europe, it means it means that uh, we have moved uh, most of our manufacturing uh, work to elsewhere, and then emissions can be measured there. But we don't take those into account. So mm -hmm. um, I hope, I really hope, that we will find the technologies and we will find uh, uh, systems in a way that uh, we can have a simultaneously economic growth and uh, cut off emissions but i don't i can't say that it's possible before i see that it really can happen so far it has not happened if we look at this uh, growth uh, what we are going to see uh, after pandemic we have already some indications from iea uh, yeah. international uh, energy agency uh, we have we are going to have a record uh, high uh, growth on emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, because we have record high uh, economic growth, yeah. and uh, and uh, and that is uh, still that connection exists, and we have to work very hard to break that connection. And I wouldn't give that kind of promise that it's easy or it can be just just execute them because we 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 don't really have uh, yet solutions for that. The, the the population growth what you mentioned it's a, it's a huge element on this uh, this game as well and especially if you take into account that simultaneous when the population will grow also standard of living will grow mm -hmm. and, and and of course it should grow because we have according to UN we have almost 
five billion people on this planet who are living less than eight euros per day. They don't mm. even know what CO2 is. And uh, and uh, really, I, I, and I, it's not yeah. their fault. Yeah, it's not their fault. Yeah. It's not their fault. So they want to have a better life and that will generate with the, their infrastructure, uh, it will generate more emissions. That's, that's the fact. So uh, IEA's uh, um, uh, leader, uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, sorry about it. But uh, mm. but uh, he he said a couple of weeks ago when the IEA released their latest report, what's what was the so-called emergency uh, path uh, to to yeah. meet 1.5 degree target. Yeah. In final uh, speech of his, he said that uh, we have to understand, uh, especially uh, among the de developing countries. That people, uh, planet, in, countries on this planet will start this climate change uh, acts uh, from very different starting points. And if we rich countries, if we don't have a solidarity mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. uh, poor countries, this is mission impossible. And mm -hmm. I, I guess he didn't say exactly these words because uh, in his position he can't say that it's mm -hmm. mission impossible. I, I can say that. But uh, but it's really it is mission impossible if uh, if we don't uh, support uh, uh, the poor countries in their uh, uh, battle against climate change because they just don't have uh, resources mm -hmm. to pay any extra. If you yeah. think about energy systems, and that's something what I what I think is a very good example. Uh, you have a countries in Africa like Mozambique. You have a country like uh, uh, Vietnam in Asia. The list is long, which don't have uh, uh, electricity in some areas at all. They start from the zero. Mm -hmm. And when you start from the zero, somebody might think that, oh, it's fantastic. Then you can do uh, uh, wind energy or solar industry energy. But uh, that can you can only do if you have existing infrastructure where you have a grid connections, where you have a, yeah. a hydropower, a nuclear power or something else for those moments when sun is not shining and uh, wind is not blowing. So yeah. if you start from the zero, you you ask that, okay, I need the lights uh, during the night or evening. So uh, yeah. if sun is not shining, what I'm going to do with that kind of system? Quite fair mm -hmm. question. And yeah. and and then, then we are coming to the technology uh, uh, solutions like power to X. Uh, uh, this is uh, maybe the audience not uh, that well known, but... Uh, but uh, it's uh, basically uh, the technology which based on the hydrogen, we will use uh, uh, renewable electricity to, to produce hydrogen from the water. And mm -hmm. then we'll catch uh, the CO2 either from the uh, emission source directly from the factory or we take it from the atmosphere and we put hydrogen and uh, CO2 together and we are getting hydrocarbons. Uh, and mm -hmm. hydrocarbons are all uh, fossil fuels, what we do have today uh, mm -hmm. uh, in our system. And those kind of products we can store and we can handle them. We call them synthetic fuels. And yeah. that, is the, that is the future, uh, what, what we really, uh, or that is the missing technology. It's not the technology is not missing, but it, all these things will work as an individual thing. But uh, putting everything together, we have some demonstrations around the world, but we didn't. We don't have yet uh, uh, industrial scale uh, uh, factories like that, and they are going to be at the beginning very expensive. But those mm -hmm. kind of things we definitely need to be able to to build up the energy system where we don't need fossil at all. Yeah. But Mika, isn't it that also our life standards? You know, you mentioned better life what is better life right so it's because uh, better life is for some people having several cars several homes fly flying around so it's all based on energy consumption so we correct to change this better life uh, perception what is better life maybe being more with a family having one house but uh, living in more in the nature you know so this i think also must somehow change before we can this you are you are you are you are absolutely right you're absolutely right so uh, 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 because it's quite clear that uh, these five billion people who are living less than eight euro per day 
uh, they have to have they have all rights to improve their uh, standard of living and if they will do that it will request more uh, energy it will request more uh, natural resources so then us if we look at our people who are living in western uh, western countries i cannot talk too much about this because i'm in privileged uh, position by myself uh, but uh, but but we we should be happy uh, with the present uh, standard of living I guess it's not really something too much to ask, really. If uh, we say that, why don't we just be happy with the present standard of living? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. even a little bit less. Some people could have much more less, but uh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> but that that is that is uh, thinking. <laughs> yeah, but that is that is thinking what we should should uh, should talk about more because uh, yeah. if we look at the total system uh, systems point of view it's necessary that uh, we will uh, create uh, the system where uh, 60 percent of the population can still improve their standard of living and it's very difficult to make that work in case we all in western world still would like to have a another car another house and uh, another uh, round trip around the world and uh, a couple of sailing boats uh, on top of that and uh, all that stuff so um, yeah and and uh, the life can be even much more happy i i fully agree so it's yeah. uh, it's totally uh, depending on uh, your own mindset but i'm very yeah. optimistic on this matter i think uh, next generation uh, our yeah. children they already think differently yeah they already That's think true. differently and uh, and uh, we we have to give us uh, time. The human is that type of uh, animal that uh, Homo sapiens that we would like to see everything happened during our lifetime. And uh, <laughs> if we <laughs> if we if we look at the history and we look at the, the future um, from the history, we can learn a lot of things. Uh, many things, big changes, good changes, uh, has taken some time. And um, and I think we have enough knowledge and intelligence in in this uh, world that uh, our children and their children uh, they find a way to live better in balance with mother nature than than what we we have done. That's and uh, in, and 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 that respect, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic yes. about it. But of course, we could could do uh, our share and speed up the process yeah. to get rid of uh, unsta unsustainable uh, lifestyle and uh, and move to move to the renewable world but i have to say that i'm not a perfect role model by myself either i i travel i eat uh, meat um, i do, i i do, i do my my daughter oldest daughter will complain about that uh, every day uh, not every day but uh, every now and then and um, so uh, I'm not do, I'm not a role model, and I don't want to be a role model. I'm just uh, doing the things what I can do, and and uh, and then uh, I guess everybody should uh, give uh, her or himself uh, mercy in that respect. That mm -hmm. life cannot be miserable. Uh, you have your own life, and it's your own life, and it's only life mm -hmm. what you have. So uh, it's uh, it's important that you will find happy feelings out of it and and taking for example this uh, climate change so seriously that uh, you are having a nightmares and uh, psychological <laughs> problems because of that it's <laughs> ben have it's, nightmares. <laughs> uh, it's it's not worth it it's not worth it yeah. it's uh, we are going to solve it it will take some time but we will we are going to solve it so it's um, also being so optimistic you know not all the guests are so optimistic <laughs> well, I'm happy well, we have optimistic one. Well, today. well, I, I, I don't see that pessimist. Uh, pessimist can ever let him or herself down <laughs> because <laughs> she, she or he is thinking uh, already uh, that everything goes wrong anyway. But uh, <laughs> optimist, uh, optimistic people, they can make the change to happen because mm -hmm. you have to have hope. Without hope, you don't have action, and yeah. and uh, and even if the hope is small percentage, 
uh, we still have hope and uh, and uh, I'm a great believer that uh, we can make this change happen. I'm not worried about the technology at all. I think uh, uh, what what is uh, what comes to technology, we will find a solution. I'm worried about uh, solidarity between the people. Yeah. That's what I'm uh, worried about. That is the mm -hmm. that is the. Do we have enough wisdom uh, mm -hmm. to to make investments, for example, to the developing countries where we are not getting any other benefit than uh, than uh, than Mother Earth will yeah. feel better? So but, is but that then, good reason enough to make investment? In my opinion, it is. But we need uh, regulatory rules to make it happen in a market economy. Exactly. Mm. But there I come to the question about the government system, because the changes you mentioned, like in the history or past, a lot of problems were solved. by. But now we have democratic system. And there, I, in my opinion, one of the weaknesses, if you look at Japan, it's one of the most advanced and industrialized nation per person energy consumption is very high, like every other industrialized nation. And they were quite very well on their way to cut down their CO2 emission and turning their energy production to green. And then the earthquake and the tsunami at Fukushima happened. And if you, then the whole public opinion turned against the nuclear energy. And now you see Japan is building again more and more coal power stations, and they're planning to build even more. Same is happening in countries like Germany, where the public opinion changes from one day to another because of a reason, and then the government acts accordingly. So what would you think about this? That is, um, I have thought about a lot. It's a, it's a very, um, very big challenge for the democracy. Uh, I, I, I'm a great believer of democracy. Don't read me wrong. I, 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 we have all seen that what kind of things can happen if you don't have democracy. So democracy yeah. has own weaknesses, but uh, but it's still best system by far. Uh, yeah. But democracy yeah. can deliver. Democracy can deliver also these kind of results. And yeah. and uh, I think answer to those kind of problematic uh, situations is that we still have to deliver right type of information to the people as as much as uh, even if the things go wrong then uh, we just can't keep up we just have to come again with the new information and say that come on let's think rethink this uh, is this really the reason uh, to do uh, this type of thing and i i, I use this your your example was very good one and now, um, what is going to happen in Germany? They they are closing uh, nuclear uh, nuclear power plants, which could work very well next uh, 10, 20 years, yeah. whatever. But that would help a lot uh, in EU's uh, tr transformation period if those uh, nuclear power plant would continue. Yeah. And and the reason why they have decided to close it down like you said it was uh, Fukushima probably uh, was the the last trigger they mm -hmm. had already uh, before that the doubts but uh, that was the last trigger and what is what is now happening after that these these uh, power pl pow nuclear power plants which are there which could work still many decades forward they are closing them down and not more than 100 kilometers from German border, uh, Poland is going to build the new ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. how is that possible then? Uh, and uh, and then we are coming to the to the again to the point that even inside EU, we don't have uh, uh, common rules. We don't make the. Uh, make the analysis uh, outside of the borders. We just look at our own country and maybe we look at EU, but definitely we don't look at what's going to happen because of our decision outside of EU. And here, German uh, German uh, citizens, they will find out uh, sooner or later that, okay, we have decided now to close our nuclear power plant, but this uh, Polish guys, they will build up the new ones uh, next to our borders. and. Uh, and is it better that the, the nuclear power plants is on the other side of the border or in our side of the border? I, I guess um, democracy has to think about that uh, in some point. Yeah. 
I, I think it's still not too late uh, to make another decision and uh, say that why don't we postpone this closing of these nuclear power plants in yeah. Germany? Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mika, and what do you think about the last uh, legal case in Netherlands against Shell, where the judge held them responsible for the damages which will be caused by cli for climate change in the future? Well, uh, I think I, I said a little bit about that matter already at the beginning, that uh, it's a quite uh, tricky if you pick up one company and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, start to start to make rules against uh, against that and here especially when you they picked up the shell which is uh, in my mind uh, from the oil company is the most advanced they yeah. like i said that they have given a promise that they will uh, they will uh, uh, be a uh, biggest uh, uh, renewable electricity producer uh, 2030 decade and and uh, there are some other uh, oil companies who are not committed to do anything i i don't yeah. name them but uh, but uh, but like <laughs> i said I, I before legal case started yeah. or afterwards they before had promised but now okay, they they yeah. mentioned that they will speed it up okay yeah now they yeah. speed it up and and in in one way this kind of uh, legal cases they can be useful that they will send send a strong signal mm -hmm. what is the expectation of the population and expectations of uh, democracy yeah. but it's very dangerous in case uh, you will really go to the after one company only uh, i think the court should have gone after all companies who are in yeah. in same industry and 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 not uh, picking up the one company and especially this time it went totally wrong because they pick up the wrong company <laughs> so 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 but uh, but as as a policy i i i i don't like this type of um, uh, idea like that we maybe also yeah um, i i i think uh, i i know that they are trying to do uh, ultimate best on this field and in that respect uh, if if uh, you speed up the, their uh, emission, uh, uh, taking emission down too quickly, what will happen then? Uh, their cash flow from the business, what somebody is doing anyway, will go down and their capability to make these new investments will suffer quite substantially. Uh, if I look at my business, some, some people have said to me uh, during our, our uh, voyage that, uh, Mika, you have a CO2 aware energy producer and seller uh, vision. Why don't you stop selling gasoline and diesel today? You can you can do that. I said, well, I can do that, but then I don't have a healthy cash flow, and where where I'm going to get all the money uh, to to execute this uh, renewable energy R and D uh, project and investments? Uh, where the money is coming from? And that is uh, important to understand that uh, it's uh, this. Uh, big oil companies and big fossil energy companies they have a huge balance sheet and regulators should make sure that the balance sheet is used to make this transformation possible mm -hmm. yeah. and and one, one more topic which has been very interesting in this sector uh, because uh, you know i'm also with the rockefeller brothers and they started initiating this uh, disinvestment so this a kind of activism investors. Uh, you don't have problems with that, but companies which have a lot of shareholders have problems with that. For example, you must have heard that in ExxonMobil uh, last month, I think two weeks ago, or last week, they fired two of the directors. They were ousted by the shareholders. So there's this kind of disinvestment movement also going around in the world where the shareholders are withdrawing money from fossil fuel companies. Even here in Zug, uh, companies like, uh, what's Glencore? the name? Glencore and everybody's having problem because they're losing shareholder uh, shareholders who are disinvesting what do you think about that well uh investors they they have all right to do so uh, so i i, I guess uh, they, they are they are having probably different reasons uh, some of them are there for ideal reasons some some of them are there for monetary reasons whatever reasons are but they have total right to do whatever they wish uh, as as long because they are shareholders, that's their their uh, their role that they can uh, force the company to do uh, according to their will. But uh, again, here I would like to demonstrate that uh, uh, if you are collecting uh, so-called points by being uh, being uh, 
publicly uh, allowed and uh, and uh, forcing some somebody to do something uh for example board members in in exxon that is a good example they were by the way finnish uh, lady was selected uh, to the uh, exxon board and it was a big news here in finland and she has done career uh, earlier in neste oil uh, uh, on biodiesel side and um, you can do such a kind of actions but in final end uh, this board they still have to make decisions in a way that the company is profitable uh that's according to law as well that the stock listed company uh directors has to make uh, such a decisions that the company is profitable and uh, and uh, idealist uh, type of approach is one approach but still you have to have a common sense and business sense on those proposals that the company can deli- really deliver after those decisions positive cash flow that's um, that's necessary to make the transformation yeah, to happen do share a duty of course of uh, the board to deliver also to investors it's absolutely correct yeah. uh, mika we are running out of time a very quick okay. one <laughs> challenging question it's challenging but uh, let me ask it and please be short in your answer so it's about norway being a very good example uh, like moving to into green energy you know and cutting down co2 emissions but still uh, norway is supplying other countries with fossil fu- fuels in the world and this is like exploding uh, exporting uh, co2 emissions to other countries right right china is doing supplying africa and asia with their coal power stations so what what do you say to that Well, uh, they are they are a little bit different stories. Both uh, uh, Norway and <laughs> no, no, Norway and China. I'm I'm very sure. I I, I think uh, even if Norway will stop uh, uh, the oil and the gas production, uh, uh, still Saudi Arabia and Russia will supply double times that. Uh, so it doesn't really solve anything. I rather see that this money goes to Norway, which will deliver back quite a lot uh, because they are. Like like I said, that they are highest in the electricity car density, and they are using yeah. huge amount of government subsidies to to make this uh, transformation to happen. So if somebody has to benefit out of the fossil uh, fuels, I rather see that it's Norway than any other country. No. No. Okay. Maybe that's uh, the answer to that that's, one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and very last. Uh, comment from your side or like call to action to the viewers uh, maybe the fossil fuel industry uh, what would you say to them so and, what would be yeah, and, and also the common action. man the common people on the street what can they do to help the environment in your point of view i i think um, when you have a money and opportunity to buy a new car uh, then of course uh, you should buy the one where the emissions are the lowest possible there are different technologies available but of course you have to look at the, what is uh, fit for purpose in in each and every case and um, then what you can ru- do you can look at your own lifestyle that's nothing to do with uh, with the uh, car or uh, or our pieces itself but you can look at your own lifestyle what we already touched a little bit earlier that uh, what are you eating what are your your own habits uh, what are you doing eats and everything they not necessarily are that much uh, I, what comes to the impact but it keeps the uh, the subject all the time on the table and then the pressure will be there then as well that we don't forget the climate change in two years time and start to do something else so that hype what we have today Uh, it's very important that every customer will uh, do their own share that hype does not uh, be as a hype but it will continue like a process uh, uh, and we will go into the direction of a renewable energy system and sustainable world thank you thank very you very much. much i think after this interview because mika had invited us to his uh, place in finland but after this interview he is not going to invite us <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> definitely why not uh, you you no, didn't ask it i i i i have uh, joined your interview it's it has been very very interesting and uh, hopefully the 
the the audience as well. Uh, that's always uh, difficult to say if they have uh, enjoyed at all. But uh, but <laughs> but uh, at least I have had a good time and thank you very much. Uh, it was a great opportunity to discuss about these important matters and uh, yeah. hopefully this is also uh, taking us uh, one one small step closer to the to the direction that we have a impact uh, like uh, like uh, we wish uh, and uh, renewable world and sustainable world is uh, yeah. one one step closer exactly. thank you mika thank yes. you thank very you very much for joining us. and very nice <laughs> summer and hopefully uh, you all are getting vaccinated soon and we can meet yeah. physically as well <laughs> yeah, that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. okay <laughs> bye 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 bye, bye. So, you, this yes. was amazing. I mean, he's such an amazing guy, and I know him quite long, so he's perfect. So, um, you forget to tell him that he will become our honorary member of Camomile. No, I think you told him. You said that. Uh, that's true. Okay, that you that's said a it. good part. So, uh, before we finish, just about next week. So, next week we will be, I think this will be Svetlana Day, because yeah, inward it is going to be a deep discussion on investment and finance in impact sector. We have two you guests. Scary our audience. Please don't <laughs> yeah. disclose. And this will be really detailed them. in finance. And our guests will again be from our friends from Finland, but one of them is living in Dubai. So it is Petri Kusisto. He's a CIO of two of the largest Finnish pension funds and uh, one of the Middle Eastern sovereign families or sovereign family fund. And he has written many articles on impact investment and has coined the term called Sustainable Portfolio Theory. It's an extension to the modern portfolio theory and current strategic asset allocation thinking. So basically going towards blended finance, but not yet. I, th I think the audience can understand. You say too much already. <laughs> so it's more like a banking and investment <laughs> sector. And, and Villa is a professional futurist and also an impact strategist. He lives, of course, in Dubai, like I mentioned. And he's the founding partner of Impact Innovation Institute and a senior faculty member at Dubai Future Academy. And he has been part, uh, participating in a lot of World Economic Forum projects around the world. So it will be very good discussion. So join us next week, same time. And keep watching Chamomile for any updates. And uh, yes, act with impact. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us and watching <laughs> us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Welcome to Swiss Impact with Banerjee's. I'm Svetlana. And I'm Ben. In season two, we will be traveling around the globe, out of Switzerland, and bring amazing leaders from businesses, thought leaders, political leaders, of course, investors and experts. We are working at implementing and work realizing all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, better known as SDGs. And they are also making profit. Hello, I am Amina Gurifakim, and I'm the sixth president of the Republic of Mauritius. My name is Parvati, and I'm a musical artist and the founder and CEO of Parvati Foundation. I'm Alicia Dishbizar. I'm an entrepreneur here in Dishbizar. I'm running on one side a financial services a company. You know, hundreds of deal deals a month, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. are seeing more things happening in this impact world. And this is yeah. because, look, the world is changing. So join us to discover impact investing ecosystem. See you every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Central European time at Swiss Impact with Benedict. See you on Friday. Act with impact.